city council meeting, Wednesday, November 13th, and this is our, um, uh, we'll start with a closed session, but we are starting a little after 5.30. As a reminder, if you would like to speak before the council tonight, please complete a blue speaker request form and give it to the clerk prior to the item. Mr. Donahue, can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Yao? Here. Council Member Lorimore? Here. Council Member Tassari? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Plot? Here. Mayor Rigby? Here. Uh, we are. We have a closed session. Mr. Donahue, do we have any requests to speak for this closed session portion of the agenda? We do not. All right. At this time, we'll, the council will be recessing to closed session. Ms. Vega, can you please introduce the items? Uh, yes, we have three closed session items, a continuation of the city manager's annual performance evaluation, a conference with labor negotiators with respect to the city manager's contract, and a conference with legal counsel on the national prescription opiate litigation. Thank you. We just returned from a uh, closed session. So Ms. Vega, will you please report the action taken during closed session? Uh, there were, it was no reportable action on the, the first two items. And then on the third, the council voted unanimously to remain in the, um, the class for the national prescription opiate litigation. Great, thank you. So now we will move on to our regular meeting of our city council, November 13th. And tonight's invocation will be given by Rabbi Mindy Harlig. <laughs> However you feel comfortable, just into the mic. Perfect. Good evening. Firstly, thank you to the City Council and Councilman Clint for inviting me to invocate tonight's meeting. There was once a rabbi and cab driver who passed on and came before the heavenly court. When he came to the cab driver's turn, God said, straight to heaven. When he came to the rabbi's turn, God said, rabbi, I'm sorry, you're going to hell. So the rabbi stunned and shocked. He turned to God and he said, God, I've spent my whole life in spirituality, doing goodness. It's possible I've made some mistakes and some wrongdoing. So how is it possible that a cab driver can go straight to heaven and a rabbi straight to hell? So God replied, Rabbi, when you were delivering your sermons, everyone was sleeping. When the cab driver was at the wheel, everyone was praying. So on that note, I would like to keep yeah, this short and read a short psalm of King David. A song of ascents. I lift my, light, I lift my eyes to the mountains. From where will my help come? My help will come from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot falter. Your guardian does not slumber. Indeed, the guardian, guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is your guard, guardian. The Lord is your protective shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you from all evil. He will guard your soul. The Lord will guard you going and coming from now and for all time. Amen. May God bestow upon us his wisdom and understanding to make the right decisions in our city and homes which will, in effect, affect the world at large. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now be led by, the, uh, by our Council Member Tassari with the, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the pledge to the flag of the, that represents the greatest country on God's green earth. Please place your hand over your heart and begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member. Sorry. 
Moving on to item number seven, our additions and revisions. The council may only add an item to the agenda after making a finding that there is a need to take immediate action on the item and that the item came to the attention of the agency subsequent to the posting of the agenda. An action adding item, an action adding an item to the agenda requires a majority vote. Mr. Donahue, are there any additions or revisions that have been requested by staff or the public? No, Mayor. Council. All right, we will move on to item number eight. Moving on to item number eight, which is our presentations and announcements. First, we have 8.1 is an update from Eastville Public Library. Branch Manager, Felicia Chen. Ms. Chen, will you please provide us your update? Good evening. Ooh, is it on? Good evening, your mayor and city council members. First, the library would like to announce that the Friends of the Library is looking for more volunteers who are enthusiastic about helping the library in the community. We are looking for more dedicated inv individuals who can be present in monthly meetings. For more information about the Friends of the Library as well as meetings, please call in or stop by at the library for more details. Secondly, as a reminder, our mini fall reading program is in full swing. Patrons will need to be present in order to sign up. All ages are welcome to participate. For every five books read and written down, patrons can receive a drawing ticket to be entered to win a $35 gift card. The last day to claim any tickets is the 22nd. Thus far, we've had at least a total of 40 patrons sign up. This event is also sponsored by local real realtor Jamie Steely. As a reminder, the public library is still part of the ZipBooks program. If a title is not listed in our Riverside Library system that you would like to see added into our collection, please uh, go to rivlib.net and click on the ZipBook tab in order to submit a form. Certain restrictions do apply and are stated on the form. Lastly, our children's family story time is back. Family story time is held every Saturday from 11 to 12 p.m. This includes a uh, song, story, stories, and a fun craft at the end. The library also does have a toddler's st uh, story time for ages 2 to 6 on Wednesday nights from 6 to 7. Were there any questions? Any question, Council? All right. Thank you for your update. Thank you. Item 8.2 is our student liaison report from our student liaison, Michael Roman. Mr. Roman. Good evening, council members and fellow citizens of Eastvale. Our Eastvale schools are currently up to some really great things. Harada Elementary's K-Kids, their service organization, is currently sponsoring their Coins for College drive right now. Students bring in spare change to turn into scholarships to award in springtime to graduating Roosevelt seniors. In recognition of Veterans Day, some awesome Harada K-Kids planted flags at Arlington National Cemetery at the grave sites of service members. In addition, they are also starting up their Hugs for Troops campaign, where they I'm sorry, uh, starting up their Hugs for Troops campaign and where they are writing letters to service members overseas. Eastville Elementary PTA just had a movie night that had a fantastic turnout. Eastville also celebrated our veterans by wearing camouflage on Friday, November 8th. CNUSD has also secured a grant for Big Brother and Big Sister organization where they, will be a, where they were able to match 22 boys and girls with high school mentors. The River Heights National Junior Honor Society and PTSA have partnered up for a fifth period food fight this month. Each fifth period class is challenged to bring non-perishable food items to earn points for their class. Before Thanksgiving break, the fifth period class with the most points will earn a pizza party sponsored by their very own PTSA. All food items gathered will be donated to the settlement house. And finally, Eleanor Roosevelt High School's theater company recently opened their winter production of High School Musical last week. It's also the reason I don't have my dress shoes because I left it with my costume. <laughs> so they invite all elected officials to stop on by and see all the hard work, hard work that they put into this production. The final showings will be this Friday and Saturday for, at 7 p.m. in the ERHS Theater. ERHS Athletics has also been winning big recently. Mustangs football is in the second round of playoffs currently. ERHS student Karen Kim won second place in CIF for girls golf and the girls golf team won the title of league champions. The ERHS girls tennis team also managed to play in the first round of CIF. And today, all, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., all high school ASB students in the district participated in a leadership summit where they heard from a guest speaker talk about the power of kindness.
Students also participated in table talks where they shared ideas from each of their specific, uh, respective school sites. Uh, thank you, and as always, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. I thought when you talked about food fight, I thought it was going to be a different kind of food fight. I was kind of excited. I'm like, wow, I want to go when watch I got, that. <laughs> when I got the email, I had to read it twice because was I was, non, yeah. It's a non-perishable scare, but I was thinking just cans. Yeah. <laughs> Council Member Lorimore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, you made the comment about your shoes when you were walking up. I actually spoke out loud, like, wow, look at those shoes. Uh -huh. uh, I think you should own it. it the, the, you need it, it you. matches your tie. Just keep doing it. Uh, I, <laughs> thank you. I try to play it. I'm envious. On I want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank Any you. other questions or comments about his shoes? <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank thanks for being much. here and thanks for your updates. Oh, thank you. I have the podium right in my way, so I didn't even get to see his shoes. So. <laughs> awesome. They probably match our city manager's socks. <laughs> All right, so moving on to item 8.3. This is a proclamation for Small Business Saturday, and I'd like to invite Harry Demon from the Eastfield Chamber of Commerce to the podium to accept this proclamation. May I say a few words or afterwards? Uh, Honorable Mayor, City Council, City Staff, and fellow citizen, thank you so much for supporting the small businesses in Eastville. And uh, we are 256 members strong chamber. 68% of our members are small businesses. They employ less than five employees. Another 22%, they employ between six and 20 employees. So small businesses are the backbone of the chamber and the City of Eastville, and we greatly appreciate your support recognizing small businesses. If I can figure out how to get that off of there. I guess I don't really have to say anything since Harry stole my thunder and shared everything already, but I'll go ahead. So just real quick, Harry Demon is our chamber president, and he started the chamber right around the time of, time of the incorporation of the city. Took off for a little bit for some, uh, some work things that he got busy doing, and he's been back for the last couple of years, and he's done a great job with our chamber here in the city of Eastville. So the city of Eastville is pleased to proclaim November 30th, 2019 as Small Business Saturday. The city of Eastville celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community. Small businesses employ 47.3% of the employees in the private sector in the United States. 92% of companies planning promotions on Small Business Saturday said the day helps their business stand out during the busy holiday shopping season. And 59% of small business owners said Small Business Saturday contributes significantly to their holiday sales each year. The City of Eastville supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy, and preserve our communities. And I would like to present this proclamation to our Chamber President, Harry Demon.
All right, we got one more presentation. The City of Eastville is pleased to proclaim November 2019 as Sikh Awareness and Appreciation Month. The City of Eastville recognizes that Sikhs have been living in the United States for more than 100 years. Sikhism is the fifth largest religion in the world, and today there are more than 23 million Sikhs worldwide and an estimated 250,000 Americans of Sikh origin, comprising nearly 40% of the nation's estimated Sikh population, residing in California alone. The City of Eastville seeks to further the City of Eastville seeks to further the diversity of its community and afford all residents the opportunity to better understand, recognize, and appreciate the rich history and shared experiences of the Sikh Americans. I would like to present this proclamation again to Mr. Harry Demon. Honorable Mayor, City Council, City Manager, and fellow citizen, thank you. Thank you for recognizing the Sick Awareness Month and Appreciation Month. Couple of data changes, there are over 30 million six around the globe and close to a million six lives in the United States. And I would like to recognize our board members are here from Sikh Temple in Norco, Manjit, Kaur, Ranadeep, our priest, head priest at the temple, uh, Nap Singh, and we got Major Harminder Singh, Rupinder Singh, and we got Baljit in the back. Thank you so much, we appreciate very much. Part of the Sikh religion is we are very uh, humble, we are very giving, and at each of the Sikh temple around the, around the world, we feed approximately a few million people around the, every temple around the globe. The largest temple, Golden Temple in India, feeds over 100,000 people every single day. So we want to appreciate, thank you very much for recognizing it, and God bless you all. Thank you. I'll just say something real quick. Harry, you couldn't be more true of those words. I, for a time there, I, I lived in Queens, New York for, for quite some well, quite some time, for, for some, several months, almost to a year. I lived in Richmond Hill. And probably, I'm probably not here in Richmond Hill because it's a very, very dense Sikh population. You couldn't be more accurate as the part, just humble, extremely nice, very giving uh, group of people. So I, that was my experience when I lived there. It was, it was just awesome, very giving. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number nine, our public comments. Any member of the public may address the council on items within the council's subject matter jurisdiction, but which are not listed on this agenda during public comments. However, no action may be taken on matters that are not part of the posted agenda. We request comments made on the agenda be made. We request comments made on the agenda be, be made at the time the item is considered and that comments be limited to three minutes per person. 
Please address your comments to the council as a whole and do not engage in dialogue with individual council members, city staff, or members of the audience. And again, as a reminder, the council does not respond to public comments, but we will make sure that uh, staff or someone will get back to you regarding your comment or concern if needed. Mr. Donahue, do we have any public comments? Yes, Mayor, we have six comment cards. The first one is for Ike Bootsma. Mr. Bootsma. Good evening. Uh, I just want to kind of invite the council, staff, and the citizens of Eastville to the uh, Winter Wonderland on December the 7th. Uh, if the council is good, they might be able to sit on Santa's lap. And uh, also another event will be Breakfast with Santa on December the 8th. Uh, they're all welcome to join us and I hope the citizens turn out and support the Winter Wonderland. I think it's a fun event and I would like to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bootsma. Mr. Donahue. Next speaker is Keith White. Mr. White. Thank you. Wait a minute. <laughs> that doesn't look like Keith. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say the bridge is so nice and complete. Um, the only problem is I won't be here tomorrow because I'll be at RT Tsunami. I just hope you guys will film it and so the next city council meeting is we can have the ceremony filmed so the people that do miss it, then we can see it at future city council meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Mr. Donahue. Next speaker is Michael O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and City Management. Um, I have been thinking about a few things lately, um, in kind of in regards to Veterans Day. Uh, the pop-up event over on Citrus, where we were at a historical East Bell site, I would say. Uh, my first time ever visiting that property and really enjoyed it. Um, my history is that I was born in the great city of Boston, Massachusetts, and I grew up outside uh, Boston in a town that was incorporated in 1651, which means in the year 2378, I think, we'll be about the same age here as we were there. Um, kind of in, junction, uh, in conjunction with that, um, my town had a historical society, we have a library, we have different artifacts that kind of cover our city or town really um, from when it was incorporated even um, and I've been thinking about we have our 10-year anniversary coming up next year and there sounds like there's a little bit of wanting to do some oomph to that I think we are at a critical junction right now in our city that we need to look at and try to capture some of the more recent history of the city going back let's say 20 to 40 years when we were really a dairy enclave we do have people here in our community that are some of the most active members of our community, I've noticed, that I think would really enjoy participating in some kind of project. Um, I've been to the Holocaust Museum, for example, and they have a lot of videos of different things and people in history, and they have a lot of things from that time that have been uh, kind of captured. I think um, somewhere in our city, in what we have, uh, or perhaps through our school, and I had a brief conversation with our uh, school liaison, that um, maybe a history project or maybe a scouting, like Eagle project, would be really good right now to try to capture that period of time. Uh, because I'm afraid if we wait a lot longer, it's going to be really hard to get that. A lot of people that were here are no longer in our city or no longer with us. And I think um, it, it's a priority that we should try to make and I think maybe incorporating it with the 10-year the anniversary is something to think about. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about and give you an idea, and hopefully we can try to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Donahue. Next speaker is Gary Tran. Mr. Tran. Good evening, Council. Uh, I'm here kind of as a follow-up to my visit back in July. I'm not aware of whether or not you guys have read the series of emails that have been 
uh, being sent back and forth between the city manager and myself and the board of the Enclave community. But uh, so about four months ago, we were here and the city council essentially adopted a or accepted a dedication to have a emergency vehicle access gate installed by Lenar Homes between our two communities. Um, there was two motions that night. One motion was to go ahead and accept that dedication. The second one was to direct the city manager to work with both communities to come up with, with a solution that addressed everyone's concerns. Lenar's concerns, the city's concerns, as well as the enclave's concerns. The gate in question was actually installed last, yeah, or I'm sorry, uh, yesterday afternoon. And uh, yesterday afternoon was the first time we've actually had any kind of idea that a gate design was submitted to the city and essentially approved. Uh, so I'm here tonight to essentially um, bring this to the city council's attention at the request of one of the council members that I spoke to previously. Uh, I understand that the council has already or delegated this task to the city manager, but I would also um, like to request that the city council actually take a more active role in this, uh, this, this situation. Uh, especially given the fact that we were completely overlooked prior. Um, specifically, um, Mayor Rigby, Councilmember Tassari, who were some of the fiercest advocates on accepting that dedication that night. I'm hoping that you guys will actually come to the table and actually have firsthand uh, understanding of, of things that are being said by our community, things that are being said by Lenar, and uh, be an active uh, participant in this uh, mediation between these two communities. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Tran. Mr. Donahue, do we have any further next, public comments? Yes, uh, next speaker is Tim Pol Polch. Tim Pudich. Pudich, it's a T, okay. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Uh, this goes, uh, piggybacks onto what Gary was talking about. I live in the Enclave there, and we, uh, when I first moved there, we had issues with security there, um, and it had to do with the Chandler area. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that be cutting through the neighborhood, stealing packages, whatever, and then hopping our wall. Our wall was only 39 inches at the time. We spent $60,000 to raise that wall to seven feet, and that cut out 90% of the problem we had with that. Um, now, like I said, at the, at the July meeting, some of the city council comments made that block walls are, uh, when they talk about putting the gate between the Prado project and ours, that block walls are uh, easier to climb than gates. And that's true if the wall's four foot tall. That wall back there is eight foot tall. The gate they installed is five foot four inches tall. And that doesn't include the curb on their side and it doesn't include the 15 inch solid steel plate along the bottom that gives a step for people to jump over that wall. Um, you know, I understand it's two private communities, but it's still an access point for any type of thievery, any type of, uh, of people wanting to jump over. And our concern is parking. The Prado is an extremely dense populated project and it's not gonna have much parking. I've driven through it, to, you know, with the, the parking stalls are minimal there. And what a better place to park than in the Enclave. I can just hop over the gate, park my car somewhere in there and it's somewhat secured, it's private. Uh, and so that's sort of our concern that how did a five foot four inch gate somehow make sense to replace an eight foot wall for security. Uh, when they first had the meeting, um, we had, I believe her name was Denise, came to our, uh, our HOA meeting. And one of the things I mentioned to her was uh, with my experience with gates was to make sure the gate was a manual gate and not an electric gate. Uh, electric gates are a lot easier for people to override and force open and that they install a street light right there so that that area is illuminated and that that helps to cut down anytime you add light to it. Uh, I just ask that, you know, with this going on and, and obviously our board being in the blind on some of this that Mr. Plot, this is your district. If you guys could just take a look, figure out what happened, see if we can do something to help resolve that, get something heightened, just make it a little bit more discouraging. We'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pudich. Mr. Donahue. Next speaker is Lisa Rodriguez. Ms. Rodriguez. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your uh, time and listening to us. I'm going to be piggybacking off of Tim and Gary as well. I just want to express my extreme disappointment knowing how 
involved we were and how concerned we are at the block wall and how I feel it was taken lightly. In fact, some jokes were made about scaling the wall, uh, block wall versus um, a metal gate as to what was installed. I'm extremely more so disappointed that we were never contacted. An email stated that it was an oversight. I have a hard time believing how many people showed up and how in involved that meeting was and how many people spoke about that, that it was just merely an oversight. I really hope that City Council looks into this, um, investigates how could this have been overlooked so easily. Um, I won't express what my true opinions are as far as why it was, but I really do hope that each and every one of you look into it because you represent us, the community, not deep pockets of a developer that's coming in and building and moving on once they sell out. We are the ones that are still going to be here, not them. We are the ones who are going to be faced with the possibility of additional crime now because the gate is so low. At the very least, they should have installed equivalent to what is surrounding our community now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Donahue. No more speaker cards. All right. We'll move on to item number 10, our consent calendar, which all matters of the consent calendar are considered routine and are to be approved with one motion unless a council member, staff member, or member of the public requests separate action on a specific item. Mr. Donahue, do we have any request to pull any items from any staff or member of the public? Yes, Mayor. We have requests to speak on item 10.15. All right. And council, are there any items that you wish to pull? Other than 10.15. If not, then I would solicit a motion on this. Make a motion to approve 10.1 through 10.14. Second. Mr. Mayor, if I, if I may, I'd just like to point out on item 10.9, a revised version of the ordinance was distributed to you at the dais this evening. So if your motion um, would be on that revised version, not the version in the packet. Mayor Pro Tem Plot, yes, that it would include it. Thank you. Mr. Donahue. Council Member Yao? Yes. Council Member Lorimore? Aye. Council Member Tassari? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Plot? Yes. Mayor Rigby? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. All right. We'll move on to item number 10.15, agreement for funding under SB 821 Bicycle and Pedestrian Facilities Program. Ms. Gina Gibson-Williams. Mayor and members of the City Council, tonight's presentation will be given by uh, Public Works, Mr. William Hensley. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council members. So this item is before you tonight for asking for additional funding to approve additional funding agreement between the city and RCTC. Uh, outline of what we'll talk about for this report is an overview of what the project is, the timeline, we'll look at the general plan and how it complies, along with the bike master plan, uh, complete street safety analysis that included uh, this project, the 65th Street uh, level of service analysis, and go over the budget. So this exhibit um, shows the project limits which is between Archibald and Hamner, two major corridors in the city. And it's a low volume street that connects those two corridors. The plan is to install a new multi-use trail on the south side of 65th Street. Um, it also includes um, installing 20 new parallel parking spaces fronting Harada Heritage Park. As you can see, uh, there are many Parks. There, I think there are four parks that are within one block of 65th Street, and there's six schools that are within a few blocks of 65th Street. So it's a great location to add a trail within the city. Timeline in 2008-9 area, uh, the county restriped 65th Street from three lanes to five lanes. City incorporated in 2010. 2013, council adopted a general plan 
which included uh, impetus for the 65th Street project. And we'll go over that in a little bit. City Council also adopted the bicycle master plan in 2016 and then uh, was reviewed and had much input into a complete street safety analysis in 2017. In 2017-18, uh, the, there was a grant application which was approved for the project, which mainly included a rehab and then a restripe. <clears throat> In 1819, city budget included the 65th Street project, as well as 1920, and this year we're bringing it to you for an additional funding request, which has been approved, and that's what the agreement's for. So the general plan uh, shows policy six uh, C15, which is uh, following the principles of complete streets to maximize visibility and access for pedestrians, and encourage the removal of barriers for safe, convenient movement of pedestrians and ensure the entire travelway is included in the design. Policy C20 includes review all existing roadways without pedestrian facilities when they're considered for improvement, which 65th Street does need some rehab work done to determine if new pedestrian facilities are warranted. 65th Street is a major collector, which is in the general plan, shows it's uh, supposed to have two lanes and has a capacity of between 14,400 vehicles per day to 18,000. From the bicycle master plan, 65th Street is shown as uh, a plan project. It's uh, listed in tier one uh, with a priority level of six in the bicycle master plan to be constructed. Uh, Strava showed that of, of this, the streets in the city, 65th Street was actually used, currently used, for bicycle traffic. Per the Bicycle Master Plan, 65th Street uh, between Archibald and Hammer it was listed for installing a bike pathway. Uh, the city won an award or a grant from Berkeley to do a study of a, sa a safety analysis in conjunction with the Riverside Sheriff's Office. <laughs> that study showed that um, overall uh, Eastville pedestrians were fairly safe in comparison to 102 similar cities. However, pedestrians that were under the age of 15, there was a significant drop uh, near schools in safety level. Um, the bottom of the chart there shows that Eastvale ranked uh, ninth worst of the 105 cities for bicyclists uh, ridden by uh, children under ages 15, which is a big reason why Eastvale won the grant for this bicycle safety improvement. This is an exhibit that was from the Bicycle Master Plan presentation presented to Council in 2016. You may remember uh, this tragedy of a bicyclist who was hit in the crosswalk there at Hamner in Lyman Knight. This chart shows pedestrian traffic collisions based on day of week in Eastvale. Uh, Tuesday and Thursday are, are peak days um, with the, the weekends being least. This is a uh, depiction of what the ultimate improvement uh, could look like. Shows a multi-purpose trail on the south side of 65th Street with a uh, future landscape sh strip uh, to separate the traffic from the, the multi-purpose trail. The current funding would be for that uh, landscape trail to be Chevron striping. And ultimately there'll be uh, funding that would come, would be searching to bring in more trees and landscaping, which we found uh, to do that's about a million dollars a mile. This is a two mile stretch of 65th Street. This is another depiction of that same configuration. Here is a mock-up of what it will look like when it's complete. You can see the parallel parking on the south side of the street with the the multi-purpose trail next to that. 
from the general plan. Uh, this has been listed in the budget since 1819 um, with a new grant award of $226,000 for the project. The total project will be $926,300. This shows the traffic volumes on 65th Street. You add the two for the total ADT, and it's about, if you look at the uh, intersection of Sumner, it's about uh, 5,000 ADT. This shows um, some counts that were taken uh, versus time. Shows that uh, uh, about 8 in the morning there's a peak, and again in the afternoon around 5 or 6 there's another peak. It's up to about 200 vehicles, 250 vehicles per hour. Uh, a one-lane road um, at an intersection can handle 1,000 vehicles per hour. So with two-lane road, it would be 2,000 vehicles per hour. So you can see uh, the current volumes are well under the capacity of 65th Street. Level of service, uh, 65th Street is currently mostly a level of service A with a seven second delay at intersections. Um, this exhibit shows the uh, AM level of service at the intersections that were measured. They're all A, except for Hamner, which is a C. And then going from two lanes to one lane, you can see that the level of service does not change, although maybe the time is delayed with one lane over two lanes by about a second. And it's the same exhibit for the PM. And that concludes my presentation. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Council, do you have any questions? <laughs> Council Member Plot. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Putin Plot. I apologize. No, 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 no problem. Thank you so much for that presentation. Sure. I, I have a quick question it's on funding. I'm, I guess I'm a little, just a little confused. What is the total grant award? Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. With this addition that we're, that we're being granted with this agreement. Got it. And then, in Measure A funds, we're spending five hundred seventy-six thousand. That's correct. Correct. And then we have to, because uh, I, I thought I thought I heard you. I, I thought I heard you say two hundred twenty-six thousand was was part of the award, but that's the appropriation that that's we have the to additional get appropriation that, that we have to take. Okay. Yes. That's what I wanted to clarify. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Councilmember Lomer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Th thank you for the presentation. Um, for for this, we're we're talking about removing two lanes of traffic in most places, so one lane either direction. Um, in that uh, slide that you showed uh, as to the full build out, um, theoretical build out down the line, have we talked with the public safety re regarding? going from wider lanes down to just the, the two lanes, what their thoughts were? Yeah, this went through a full process. Okay. When, when we, um, like, with we did the safety analysis, and, and um, so they, I think this has been vetted through that through that process. So the, the, the general the previous part of that? I, sorry. I, I'm sorry, the, the slide that's showing is not the one I was talking about. This one the, This one, yeah. So, like, I, I can see... It, I can envision, you know, before a fire truck might be able to go around somebody, this might limit options. But th this went through that process. Public safety is okay with well, us. We can, we can ask them. Yeah. yeah, if you look at this exhibit here, you can see that there is a, it will be a three lane roadway. I would love to hear if there. I would love to hear from the questions from the uh, people who want to speak on that. Okay, Councilmember Yaw. I have a question. So, uh, was 65th Street at one at at one point five lanes? Is that I'm it? Right. Is five lanes? Today. It is five lanes. Okay, it is five lanes right now. But because from what I. From what I had gathered, I thought at one point sixty five Street was one lane each way. It was. It was. For and many, then many years in in two thousand eight two thousand nine area, it was switched to five lanes. So, 
I, I wasn't here back then. Um, but what was the reasoning from switching to one lane back then to, well, two lanes to five lanes? And then, because I don't want to do this back and forth. And the next thing you know, 10 years later, we're going to switch back to five lanes. And then 20 years later, we're going to switch back to one lane. So I'm not sure why it was switched over. But again, per our general plan, our general plan only calls for two lanes there. And um, I, I mean, a lot of times the, the street widths in Eastville were, they were constructed per Riverside County standards. And so they are wider than they needed to be. So um, in terms of volumes, you wouldn't have to switch back. This, this, these volumes would project into the future that you could leave it as a three lane roadway from here on out. It, it, it's a limited roadway and it starts on one end and ends on the other. So it's not a through throughway roadway, so it doesn't need to have a lot of capacity. All right, we will go ahead and move forward with our public comments on this item. Mr. Donahue. Yes, uh, first speaker is Ike Bootsma. Mr. Bootsma. Good evening, Council. I'm all for bike, uh, bike lanes in Eastvale. But I think it would be a big mistake to go from uh, two lanes to one lane. You know, I drove down to 65th today, and we got bike lanes on both sides, and we got two lanes, and our traffic keeps increasing in Eastvale, and I think it would be a big mistake to go from, you know, two lanes each way to one lane each way. I think it would just be a congestion, and I, I think we're going backwards. Uh, when they made it from one to two lanes, they uh, said that it was the increased traffic flow and our streets are nice and wide and I think we're going backwards if we, we change them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bootsma. Mr. Donahue. Next speaker is Michael O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor. Thank you. I actually live uh, not too far to the north of uh, this street. And um, going back to 2008, I was very disappointed actually when they changed it from one lane each way to two lanes because they took away the parking that was near the dog park, which for my walk, it's with my two puppies that I have now, it's kind of a hassle to go through the neighborhood. So I liked actually parking there. And that's one of the things I do like about what I'm seeing, um, that they are planning to put parking back. I'm not sure that I like the aesthetics of the chevrons. I can envision the aesthetics with trees and a tree canopy kind of getting into a more quaint town feel. Um, I'm not so sure if we really have the need for two lanes or not, so I'm kind of neutral on that. Um, one thing that I had seen online, uh, somebody had done a survey of what do you feel about reducing lanes, and um, what I saw, I didn't uh, run the, the survey myself, and I didn't actually see the results, but I saw a summary of it. Uh, approximately 95% of the participants of that survey out of about 200 said they were against it. Now, I, you know, it hasn't translated into a lot of people here screaming, but uh, that was something I thought was uh, interesting to see. And um, one comment I have that if we do move forward with this, I would like to see us try to address the um, intersection of Peach Blossom and 65th. That's between uh, Sumner and Scholar. It's the only street that comes out from that community that's not one of the more major ones. And trying to cross there is a little bit of a hassle um, for people. So currently there's no crosswalk, there's nothing like that, but I think if we could add maybe crosswalks and a sign that there's a crosswalk there, that that would help with the safety part. And I don't think that's a big change to what's uh, looked at here. Um, I also noted in the, um, the supplemental material that was here, there were some inaccuracies. Um, the photos, for example, that showed students and bikes on sidewalks was clearly not on 65th. I'm pretty sure it's on orange near the schools. Um, and, and I thought that was a little disingenuous to include that, but um, you know that's where we're at. Uh, the other thing that hasn't been brought up is the fact that we now have a signaled interchange at uh, or intersection at 65th and uh, Sumner. And I don't know if that 
was taken into consideration with this or not, but this is something else I observed and was curious about. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Next speaker is Chad Blaze. Mr. Blaze. All right, appreciate it. Um, I'll get into it. I'm always amazed how councils, and I've been in many cities, take a genuine good-natured idea to improve something and completely screw it up with going to the far extreme. One of the best things about this city, it was, it's reasonably well designed. You can go east and west, north and south with relative ease because we built roads that met and or exceeded our ever our needs. One of the things I hate the most is when you have roadways where you're cramped in, uh, driving right next to the next person next to you or, or the pedestrians, etc. I love that our streets are wide. It's easy to get anywhere you want to go and there's not a bunch of traffic. I don't care that we're not using 65th to its capacity. I hope we never do. But it's very simple to simply say, I can go up and down, and I'm not worried about it. But this proposal is ridiculous. I get road diets. I don't believe in them. I don't, in my experience, and I'm in the field, they don't do much. I know the city manager's a guru, and he has papers out about road diets. But if you're going to do it, do it small. Take a couple feet off of the existing lanes to widen the existing bike, bike lanes if you're trying to give more space between the bicyclists and the, and the, and the vehicles or potentially go the opposite direction. Why not, we have huge wide parkways. Why not repurpose the existing landscape parkways and build the sidewalk wider and then stripe the sidewalk to have bicycles and pedestrians. You can work with JCSD. It lowers my costs that I pay in the LMDs and maintenance of those parks and the landscapes because I pay for all that. You know, our, we all, and we all do as taxpayers in Eastvale. So there are other low line fruit that you guys can look at to achieve your end goal, which is try to make it safer. But I had to laugh at the application you guys sent in because you gave the impression like somehow you weren't getting participation, but if you build it, they will come. This is not Field of Dreams. It's not going to happen. Most parents in this area that I've talked to don't want their kids to ride this, to schools because they're afraid. Not because of the cars, but unfortunately it's the society we're in. We're afraid of something happening to our kids. We drop them off at school. I know the mayor drops his kids off at school again, but I don't see them riding to school. You know, but there's a reason for it. I, when I ride the bikes with my kids, I go down to the riverbed. There's a giant trail down there that, again, the CFDs that I paid uh, for the parks paid for that. That's a safe area. It's beautiful. We ride from my house down. I don't have trouble going from 65th and, and Harrison down to that area. I'm not worried about it. My kids are on the, on the sidewalk. There's plenty of space. I get the point of this, but we've gone way to the extreme, and you've done no outreach to this community, none. I know you showed your stuff up there saying you've been talking about it forever, but I understand how government works. You talk about it internally. The community's not paying attention. This happened to you on the police thing. Once it became aware of what you were thinking about doing, people came out and came crazy. Slow this down. Don't approve this tonight. Bring it back to the community. Find out what they want. Taking two lanes roadways, you can't take it back or it costs you a ton of money to bring it back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blaze. Mr. Donahue. And the final speaker is uh, Suzanne Mason. Mrs. Mason. Um, I'm just a little nervous, so bear with me. Um, I only recently heard about the road diet, um, but I feel as a mom, I drive that street twice a morning to the junior high and to the elementary school, and I rarely see a bicycle. A bicyclist. Um, as a mom, I don't let my kids ride their bikes, not because I don't trust them. I just don't trust the people driving. I've seen them. It, it, I don't know that it would, by doing this road diet, I don't know that it would promote more people let, sending their kids or older teenagers on bicycles. Um, I use 65th more than I do Limonite because I feel Limonite is busier. So for me, I take it to sports, I take it to school, I take it to the grocery stores for most of my shopping. Um, I live right off of it. I'm just east of Cedar Creek and I've been here 12 years and I, I can't say anything bad about it. I, I like the two lanes personally. When we do ride our bikes, I don't feel unsafe in the current situation that it's in. Um, I know we just recently widened Limonite and it seems like our city is only getting bigger. So I would just wonder why we would 
make the street shorter or smaller. Um, so that's that's just my feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Donahue, do we have any other public comments? No, Mayor. All right, then we will go ahead at this time and close public comment. Uh, council discussion. Well, before we get to council discussion, I just want to clarify just a couple of things. Um, this this uh, grant, this was done back in 2017. Um, as you look at the staff report, um, just for clarification, I know on social media there's been a lot of speculation as to who pushed this forward. This was actually done under our previous city manager leadership. This was not done under our current city manager leadership. So this is not, I know there was a, a public comment that was mentioned about that our current city manager, his papers out there regarding road diets. Um, this was something that was done back in 2017 before he was even with our city. Um, so this is something we've been talking about for a while. We've also been talking about our um, our bike master plan that was also put before the public multiple times in front of the planning commission, in front of the public safety commission. Um, so we've we've put it out there numerous times to to try and get the the public's input. Um, not to say that you can. Uh, you can never have too much public input. I think you can always have more public input, but just to say that um, we have put it out there for, for some public input. So I'd like to turn to my colleagues for comments. Council Member sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Blaze brought up some good points uh, regarding, you know, the uh, magnitude of the project. I kind of agree. I would I would prefer to see something where uh, we're able to maintain the, uh, you know, two lanes in each direction, and and the whole thing about road diet, you know, that that term came from you know what the old mayor in LA was doing when they were trying to take cars off the road. There's no plan to to reduce uh, or or create congestion in in the, in the uh, city. This is all it's this is all about just creating safe bike lanes. That's it. There's no there's no plan by the city manager to to come in here and, and restrict the roadways within the city. So this the whole road diets, that, that, that's a fallacy. You know, you may interpret this particular project as creating what you call a road diet, but that, that's not, it has nothing to do with that. So, but, uh, but I do agree with the point about the, uh, um, you know, there's probably a better design, something that I would prefer over what's currently proposed. Uh, I'd like to see, you know, there's, there's, I'm sure there's a way that we can design it to preserve the integrity of the four lanes and still provide adequate uh, space for bikes. So that's, that's my opinion. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Real. I think for, for those who have attended city council or who have spoken to me know that I am in favor of bike lanes or trails. Um, I think it's something that, as especially for a family community, it's it's um it's something that I know it will be great for the kids, for, for families. Um, with that being said, I I would prefer seeing us keeping two lanes each way, and maybe narrow it down a little bit, and it might be a good thing because then you can actually reduce speed as well. Um, I am not quite sure how I feel about reducing it to one lane each way. Still contemplating um, a lot of thoughts going on in my head. And especially because as I was coming to city council meeting, I actually had to take um, Schleichman and I think it was Sumner. And it was like one lane. It, it's, it's like that intersection where it's one lane. And I was sitting there waiting for the light for a good five minutes. And I... It was. It's not that bad, um, but it was just one of those moments where I was just like, I don't want this to happen on 65th Street. So I'm, I'm. I would love to hear from other council members as well. But but yes, overall bike lanes, trails. I'm all about it. Um, it's just this one. I am. I'm thinking about it. Um, but with that being said, I like the parking space because that was one of the things that we I talked I talked to the city manager about is that whenever we have events at Harada Park, it's a nightmare there. There's never enough parking. Even with this additional parking space, I don't think there's gonna, ever going to be enough parking, but hopefully this will alleviate the, the traffic a little bit. Um, yeah, so I, I do, I love the idea of 
having additional parking. Thank you. Councilmember Lomar, or Mayor Pro Tem Plot. Can I, I'm just gonna ask one question before we get to more comments. Um, Bill, do you know by chance, um, I just lost my turn of thought for a second here. I just totally just lost my question. I'll come back. Okay. <laughs> Councilmember Lowermore. It was going to help you. It was very important. It was going to help your, it was going to help your So important you forgot it. I totally just <laughs> Councilmember Lowermore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my thoughts on this. Yes, I, 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 I like bike lanes and we have them on the road uh, uh, as was discussed earlier um, as for reducing lanes I, I I've heard discussion about the the, the roads in our city um, and I, I view the width of our roads as um, an asset to the city and um, it is something that you know, it, it was discussed in public comments earlier about that it's easy to drive, that it is wider, that, and people choose to take that route over another more narrow street. And um, there are great cities around the Inland Empire that you ha utilize uh, what the county standards associated with lane width more than we would need. And um, I, I think it's wonderful. and. Uh, there is something to being able to drive and um, not have to be worried about how close that large SUV is next to you. And it gets uncomfortable where we have had lane realignments within the city already um, to have expanded bike lanes. It makes it less comfortable to drive. And I don't think that's the way that we should go. Um, we do have the bike lanes in, in the city and, um, you know, what this, the sidewalks, I, I, I have seen people that do feel uncomfortable even though there is a bike lane and use the sidewalks. And to be honest, while driving around, uh, you know, you have, there aren't a lot of people walking on the sidewalks, um, maybe in the evening sometimes, but, uh, I, I do not like the idea of taking a four lane road removing two lanes from that. Um, it is counterintuitive to me, and uh, I, would not, I do not plan on voting in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lormore. Just yes. to, real quick, before we go on to Mayor Protem, hopefully he wrote it down. So we'll I did, I did. I'm okay. good to go. <laughs> just, uh, um, just a quick question for law enforcement. As we talk about writing on sidewalks, technically, is that legal or illegal to ride on a sidewalk well we for children it's okay to ride on, uh, ride on the sidewalks for adults they're supposed to be in the roadway conveying all the traffic rules but for safety for kids uh, no problem with riding on the sidewalks okay Mayor Pro Tem Plot well, I appreciate the applause before I begin to speak so thank you <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking real quick uh, now I have my questions there's two of them expiration of the grant is, do we know when that is, I know it's kind of pertinent. It, it, it is decision. pretty quick. Um, yeah. We did ask if uh, we did extend this to the next meeting, if, if they would allow that, but it is getting close to expiring. Okay. So, so we have, do we have a yeah. kind of a set date? You have a date, Frank, would you give a date? Yeah. Uh, with our CTC, uh, like ASAP. So Paul, I would say December would be the date. Okay. And then when studying 65th, I mean, I, anecdotally, I, I kind of like Suzanne, I, I take it every morning to take Penelope to her daycare, and that's kind of where I go through it. It's typically in generally the most congested time, but would be the most congested time in the morning, and then evenings every now and then I'll take it. As far as your study, though, I mean, how how active is 65th in general? You know, and, and what kind of an impact would it make, you know, in comparison so, maybe to other roads? So I'm going to show you our uh, our volume count here. Oops, went the wrong way. All right, there it is. So this shows you um, vehicles per hour. And um, so you can see in the morning between 7 and 8, yeah. it gets up to be about 250. And then the afternoon, it's about the same. 
it, you have a morning peak and your afternoon peak. Typically, your afternoon peaks are, are more than your morning, but in this case, um, it's not that way. But um, as I mentioned earlier, um, a, a two-lane road at intersections has a capacity of 2,000 vehicles per hour. Mm -hmm. And so we're only at 250. We're way, way under capacity. So a one-lane roadway um, with a capacity at intersections of 1,000 vehicles per hour is plenty. So this is well beneath that. Um, I know um, Council Member Yao mentioned Sliceman. That's a through street. That's why when that gets down to one lane, that's why it takes so long. This street is, it ends, it dead ends on either end. And so it's not a through fare. I have a third question. When, yeah. when this went to the Public Safety Commission back in 2017, was that pretty much, was, was it pretty much a unanimous vote, a 5-0 to approve this? And were they kind of looking somewhat at this depiction? I mean, I, I know you know, I know you weren't there yeah. at the time, so maybe. I don't know, I mean, I know it was approved. Um, I know there was concern at that point in one of the comments about um, reducing the lanes, but again, with with it, it certainly it was consistent with the with the bicycle master plan. It was consistent with the general plan, and, and so this is just this is like a perfect project. It's listed as a tier one, priority level six. It, it's it's exactly what um, was planned. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sure. So, but yeah, my comments would be I, I'd like to see. I think there's been some good comments here. I think there's arguments for t both sides of the argument, but I think I'd, I'd like to see maybe some more public input on it to get some real, not social media driven, but just real information that we can take and use and then see where we go. I, I think there's a lot of, I, I kind of in the sake with Jocelyn, I think there's some there's some really good perks to having trails and, and, and good bike lanes. I think there's some perks to it. Whether they utilize or not, I think that's yet to be determined because that's really not built out, right? So how do you, I mean, we are, our public, one of our public comments came in is, is, is bike pants, right? So um, he's riding bikes. So I think there's, it's, it's something I think we have to look at more in detail. Um, and like, I think there might be a happy medium here to where we could still, and we have a short time on this expiration of this grant, but where we can still qualify the grant and the way it designs and maybe there's not taking up as much lanes. Um, but I, I would say let's, my opinion would be kind of, let's, let's look to have more public comment on it. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Plot. Council Member Biel. Um, is this design definite? Because I'm hearing from not only myself, but also other council members who are not opposing to this idea necessarily, but we maybe would like to see other designs. Yeah, so the design is not definite. Okay. Um, I think we have until March to actually have it constructed. Is that correct? Right. We have to be to bid. So we have time to modify the design and have you approve that if you'd like. Okay. okay. Thank you. The deadline is to accept the, the funding, which is going to be in December, and then we have to be out to bid um, in March, so then there, we'll have that window to, to modify it. So a question off of that, what happens if we accept the funding but we don't use it? That, that um, it just makes it tough for future funding. I mean, so like you, if you, there was an option to maybe widen and put a buffer between the, the bike lanes, there, there may be things we can look at that would still comply, that still kept the, the two lanes in each direction. We'd have to look into that, but um, it's, not a, it's never a good idea to accept it and then turn it back because that looks bad when you go after future funding. Okay. And when we looked into this, when we did the studies, did we take into account like future growth, not only in our city, but also Chino, Ontario Ranch, all that area that can impact traffic in our city yes yeah okay. all right I, I have a concern on decreasing the lanes as you look at um, the lanes one of the major concerns is and I'm sure the, the Masons are well aware of with the location of where they live going to the schools you have 65th, 65th Street that backs up during that school time now with two lanes each way um, because of people turning left to go south onto uh, Harrison there for the school. Um, a concern is 
is now that you have less lanes, the people that are turning left, eventually that's going to back up into the through lane, which is going to make traffic even worse in that area. Yes, it's only a couple of times a day, but still it is a couple of times a day. So I think that's something that uh, when we take away the lanes, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, so just something for us to consider. The other thing is on the flip side, going back to Mr. Blaze's comment, I agree. I think it's nice to have the, the open areas, the open streets, the open, um, again, going back to what Suzanne said too, being able to go through and know to take different streets versus other streets. The thing we have to remember as residents too, though, and I'm sure law enforcement, we hear it a lot from law enforcement, that we get a lot of complaints about speeding racing cars. And that happens when the roadways are wide. So we've just got to realize, we've just got to, we've got to realize from a resident standpoint that there's a give and take, that we've got to deal with one thing to receive another thing. So if we want our wide open streets, we've got to realize we're going to have speeding racing Novas that are going to be going down the street um, at all, all hours of the night. So um, Mr. Mason has a Nova, so that's why I had to throw that out there. But, uh, but we're going to have, we're going to, we, we just got to realize that we, we, it's a give and take. So we've got to realize that if we want traffic to slow down, one of the measures we can use is by decreasing our streets. If we aren't worried about that, then we can leave them wide open and we can just realize that that's what we're going to have. Um, me personally, with my kids where they go to school, I would, we, we ride every so often to school, not as often as we would like, but we would ride more often if it was a little bit safer. Um, but that doesn't mean to take away a, a lane. So. I like this, but just not the fact of taking away a lane and, and going, like Mr. Blaze said, going to the extravagant um, bike path. If there's a way that we can find a happy medium, keep the lanes, have the bike paths, make the connectivity, um, because at the same time, it's going to help alleviate, hopefully, some of our traffic by some of the people encouraging the bike, um, but we don't want to take away the lanes to make that happen. Council Member Yeah. Read my mind. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree with you, Mayor. I, you know, I, I, I'm well aware that we do have existing bike lanes on 65th Street, but the reality is, and as someone who who does bike often along with my family, um, we don't feel safe riding bikes in the city. And and not only that, even when I'm driving, even though there are designated bike lanes, I don't feel safe driving right next to. Um, to the cyclists or bicyclists, it's there's definitely room for improvement. Um, I'm not sure if this is the solution, but I, I I would love to see something else that that would both benefit the pedestrian bicyclists and also drivers. I had a mayor pro tem experience. I forgot what I was going to say, and I just remembered. <laughs> so, uh, but. Uh, I remember when the, it was the one lane each way and you could park in front of the dog park and we did that a lot. And I could remember when it was put to the two lanes. Lieutenant Martin can plug his ears right now, but I was guilty of parking there after um, the, the one lane was made and then they finally started sending deputies over and when you were at the dog park, you'd run out and go move your car real quick before you get ticketed. So it was nice to have the parking there. Um, but it's one of those things, once again, we just have to have the give and take as the deputy walks back in so he can figure out which one I am, huh? So he knows to tick and you know. <laughs> but I think that's just one of the things that we got to realize is there's give and takes with this and we just got to figure out what we want um, and what we're willing to deal with. So I, I personally like, would like to have a bike lane, but I'd like to see if we could keep the, the streets the way they are with the two lanes. So I don't know if that's narrowing down, if that's going into some of the, the right of way or, or what we can do. Um, so I don't know if it's what my colleagues want to do if we continue this or if we approve with a condition to revise or, or what we do. I'll leave it up to my colleagues. I Mayor think, President Plot. I think maybe I'd like to table it with a the, with the different design, that taking the suggestions that we're not to cut into, the, if, we're, if it's even possible, um, to cut it, to, to take away those, to not take away those lanes, if it's even possible, and still stay compliant in getting that grant with the expiration date that that, that is caught on to it. But I don't know if that's asking for too much, but uh, we'd like to see something a little different that maybe if we, we have suggestions or comments of what that may look like, um, you know, that's kind of how I like to at least 
put it out there, and then you guys can modify it from there. It, I, with, I second that. W with that being said, I don't know. That was quite a motion. It wasn't a motion. Okay. I'm just kind of making it. <laughs> it wasn't a motion at all. It was. It was. I hopeful appreciate Josh's second motion, right? But it, it, well, it wasn't a motion. Look at that. He's getting a hand. Yeah. A motion. It, it would be a motion. Just trying to create at least a foundation to where if we were to if we were to proceed with something else. Uh, my suggestion would be to modify the design to where we're not taking away the lanes, but still, if there's a if there's a happy medium with having bike lanes still there, uh, and, and and modify it, that still is compliant with the grant. So um, that would be kind of like the foundation, and you guys can kind of modify from that point. Yes, it's not a motion as of yet, but just wanted to get input. Mayor, yes, if if I might suggest, we we could o over the next couple weeks work on a couple different concepts of a good, better, best approach with some of the different things that you have shared here tonight uh, of um, trying to maybe bring parking back in front of Harada, maybe maintaining the, the left turns at Harrison, you know, a number of different things. And we could say one of them could be buffered bike lanes and we narrow travel lanes or the two-way left turn lane width or something like that. There's things we could look at out there. Uh, um, right now, the bike lanes are about five feet wide and two feet of those are in the gutter so uh, or two and a half feet or so are in the gutter so uh, um, uh, we, we bill and the team could could look at the, a few different approaches and maybe bring that back before you in December to see if if, um, if any of those would be acceptable to you uh, to achieve some of the the goals of the general plan and the bicycle master plan and the traffic safety analysis um, but we can um, do that and then in December we can either tell RCTC that we don't want the funding or that we want the funding and this is what we're going to do and then we get busy on designing it between then and get it out to bid so we can go to construction if that's the desire. I like that and going back to one of the comments that Mr. Blaze made was the, the community involvement um, because this is a short time period I think it's it's important for us to ask those that are here those that listen to this those that, that read the minutes um, that come and be involved because this is this isn't something that we can carry out for months to have separate workshops and all that kind of stuff so if there's comments that you have, please contact staff, please contact the council members, if that's the way that we decide to go. I'm just saying that if we want public comment ple or public input, then please um, share that with us. Send us an email um, as council member, yeah, Facebook message, whatever. As council members, we're open to meet and discuss and we can pass on information to, to staff. So um, because of the, the time crucial with this, um, I don't think it'll be that we'll be able to do an actual workshop regarding something like this, but we are available to discuss once again if that's the way that yeah. my colleagues decide to go. I think to be clarified in my decision making process, I'd like to, and again, you just kind of depend on the public coming out and saying, well, at least we had a, a decent turnout with, with having public comment. So I appreciate that. I'd like to just hopefully throw it out there one more time and get some traction that we're still talking about it and people are more willing to come out and give their concerns and also get a realization of what's actually happening because sometimes people come out and they don't realize. They just hear one side and that's all they hear. But for my decision making, I, I'd love to get just a couple, I'd love to get more public comment to kind of get some type of decision formulated. I, it, it would help me in my, know my decision on that one. Councilmember Lorimer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can, can we be clear on timelines? I, I, I heard some discussion of drop dead dates, but particularly given the uh, holiday season that we're entering into, um, do we have uh, a clear understanding of dates at this time at, from staff? They um, have extended it already. They, they had asked us to get this approved or before now. Um, so they've extended it to December. So pretty much we have till December 11th. But I can confirm that and get a, a, a drop dead date um, by talking to them tomorrow and get back to, to council on that. Okay, uh, appreciate it. I, I think, well, at least for me, and th this is not necessarily doesn't need a response, but for me, what how this process has been playing out over time. I remember previous iterations of the, that timeline that, that was discussed earlier, and I, I, I believe, if 
memory serves correctly, that I asked, well, we're not approving anything, right? We're not approving a specific project. The answer was always, no, you know, we're just, we're, we're looking to get this funding or, you know, we'll, this will come back to you later. Um, and coming back to us later, at, at least for me, it, in, in this form, it, it, it's difficult that, you know, we're being asked uh, as a, whether or not to approve funding for a, a project as envisioned by, uh, as shown in these slides, that it is, for me personally, not, not something that um, I would agree with. If we are actually consulted along the way prior to uh, it even being submitted that we're not running into these deadlines, it would be more helpful uh, for me that and in that process, we could have been um, reaching out to the, through that process, we could have been having that feedback from the community as well as to running into this deadline. So um, comments for the future. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Then I would solicit a motion on this. Can I solicit a motion to prove, I guess, Brian's comments? Do we need to clarify what those comments were? Because I think he was, you, know, you want to reiterate, Brian, on that? Because I think it was kind of in line with what we were talking about. Just make sure you guys kind of hear it and I mean, agree. I don't know that we're going to be able to pull off a community workshop between now and the next council meeting with deadlines of staff reports yeah. and Thanksgiving and all of that occurring. So my suggestion is, is that we use... Um, the next council meeting as an opportunity to discuss the concepts and and you either decide that we want to proceed with one of the concepts or we don't want to proceed with any of the concepts and, and leave the roadway the way it is and we just return the money to our CTC. Yeah. And you clarify that there are maybe three different concepts that we can. We'll, we'll come up with multiple. So we can choose one of those concepts or choose none and leave it the way it is. So a fourth concept. Okay. And then we'll use that as a, 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 another community engagement just like tonight. Basically a workshop, but it'd be in a council meeting. Yes. The, It'll be a, an agendized item. Yeah, I think that's that's about what I'm looking for. Is that I would I would make a motion on that. Second. Mr. Donahue. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry Council Member Lord. Yeah, to, to clarify, so my understanding is in, in essence we're tabling this until the next yeah. continue. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Yao? Yes. Council Member Lorimore? Aye. Council Member Tassari? Affirmative. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Plot? Yes. Mayor Rigby? Yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. Thank you. And once again, for those of you that are here that listen to this, if you can please reach out, let people know that uh, we're more than happy to chat with them. Staff is more than happy to chat with them just so that we can make sure that we have as much input on, on something like this as we can and as the community desires. So thank you for being here. And no speedy Novas. <laughs> All right, we will be moving on to item number 11, which is our public hearings, which we don't have this evening. So we'll be moving on to item number 12, City Council Business. 12.1 Eastville 2040 General Plan Update. And this will be by Ms. Gina Gibson-Williams. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Item 12.1 is the very first step in implementing the vision for Eastvale's future, uh, the general plan. So as you know, the general plan is a legal document that the council will use to guide uh, long-term development in Eastvale for the next two decades. So um, Eastvale's general plan is about seven years old. And as you know, when the city was incorporated um, back in 2010, uh, we were given, as all cities are given in the state of California, 30 months to adopt their first general plan. And so the fruit of that was the general plan that we have on the books today. So um, now Eastville has grown rapidly, as you know, and given that less than 15% of the land in the city is vacant, it's time to ensure that the general plan, this long-term document, meets the needs of the community now and in the future. So this agenda item outlines uh, the process to update the general plan and prepare uh, the companion environmental document. 
So we are seeking approval to utilize the services of Michael Baker uh, to assist uh, the community development director, me, <laughs> in, in uh, preparing the uh, general plan project. Uh, Michael Baker, as you know, provides planning services to the city right now and then also um, they are known um, in the industry for their expertise in general plans, uh, both uh, represent representatives of Michael Baker and audience this evening. So now if approved, the city will enter into a contract with Michael Baker for the necessary work. Um, and we will also seek specialty services. This year's housing element, uh, as you know, has legislation concerning the housing element that is key to our future as well as some other uh, sections to the general plan that you haven't seen yet, like environmental justice, et cetera, new laws that have come into effect since the last time the general plan was adopted. Um, we do have funds that were allocated under a previous year's budget. Uh, so this would be the implementation of that, uh, hiring a consultant to come on board and assist us with this process. Um, so if the council would, we would ask that the council would do three things this evening. First, to approve the overall concept of general plan as we've laid out in the staff report um, with the funding that's already been allocated. And then second is to authorize the city manager into to a contract uh, with Michael Baker to negotiate um, what the proposal would be and the scope uh, to assist with this general plan process. And then thirdly, uh, authorize both the city manager and the community development director myself to develop a procurement process for the additional expertise needed for those um, elements of the general plan that are now required from legislation and or state law uh, so that we can deliver a general plan that meets our needs, is legally compliant, and encapsulates the vision for the future. Uh, this concludes my presentation at this time. I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have about the general plan. This is exciting stuff for the city. Good times. And uh, again, Michael Baker's representatives are in the, e are in the uh, audience this evening. Thank you. Mr. Donahue, do we have any public comments on this? No, Mayor. All right, Council. Any comments, questions for staff? If no questions or comments, then I would solicit a motion on this. So I move. <laughs> Second. Mr. Donahue. Council Member Yao? Yes. Council Member Lorimore? Aye. Council Member Tassari? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Plot? Yes. Mayor Rigby? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. And we, I thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. This is an exciting time for Eastville to be able to plan ahead and, and plan for our long-term future. So this is exciting for us. Item number 12.2, utilization of professional state and federal design standards for the city of Eastville public right-of-way. And this is again by Ms. Gina Gibson-Williams. Or Mr. Hemsley. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it you. will indeed be by Mr. Hemsley. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This item is related to the utilization of professional state and federal design standards for the city of Eastvale public right of way. Uh, basically, we're asking council to um, allow the, the city engineer to use standards other than what has been the, the precedent um, of using county, only county standards for the design of, of roadways. Um, since incorporation, there's really been no overall standards that have been established by the city and staffs continue to use those standards. So we we'll recommend that you allow the city engineer to use design standards and design guidance for the public right of way from established state, federal agencies <coughs> and professional organizations, in, including um, the uh, American Association of State and Highway Transportation Officials, Caltrans, Department of Transportation Standards, Highway Design Manual, um, the manual, California manual on uniform traffic control devices, green book, uh, to name a few. Uh, this will allow the city engineer to utilize design standards that will best fit with the city's needs for those projects currently under design, including uh, Hamner Place and Limonite Bridge. Um, so w that's sort of been the impetus of bringing this to council is that um, if, if we are allowed to use these kind of standards or go with this, setting this precedent, then we can um, save money with 
with the Maimonite Gap Closure Project by um, selecting a design speed that's uh, different than what normally would be and would probably end up saving the city in the order of half a million dollars. So that um, concludes my staff report. Be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. Mr. Donahue, do we have any public comments on this item? No, Mayor. All right. Council, any questions, comments? Councilmember Lormore. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, honestly, I, I, I read through this, and I, I must admit to having been the, the staff report, I, I found it a little bit light and uh, more confusing um, than anything else with all the acronyms at the end as to what we're attempting to do. I, I appreciate the, the presentation um, and the, the discussion about how it would impact, uh, for instance, the Lemonite Gap. Um, but could, could you expand for me, please, uh, as to what these different um, standards would mean? Um, so you've mentioned the Lemonite Gap, if you could articulate Sure. Uh, unpack that a little bit so more if there in, are other in terms examples. of sure in terms of limonite gap um, the county standard would be a, a design speed for that roadway of 50 to 55 miles an hour um, that design speed doesn't mean that's the actual speed but it's what the road would be designed to accommodate with that uh, that speed then the the curvature of the road would need to be much larger to accommodate that speed and then with that, um, the bridge would, have, would need to be um, longer. And, and so then there, there's the half a million dollars that I, that I mentioned um, with regard to that one standard. Um, lane, lane widths, uh, standard, I think, between 12 to 14 foot standard width. Um, as um, the mayor had mentioned, the, the wider the lanes are, it's like a freeway. The faster you can go and you feel safe going fast. So if we, if we can narrow those to within a reasonable uh, width for design speed that they, the road should be designed for, for local roadways, then um, the actual speeds that, that occur out there will be less. So you can design a road um, with a tighter curve, for instance, than maybe uh, 10,000 foot radius. So. That's one example, and also uh, it allows us in locations uh, such as in front of schools that we can um, uh, do some kind of modifications that would uh, allow us to slow traffic down with those design, as opposed to like, for instance, a, a, a collector street in front of a, a school would need to have 12 foot wide lanes, which would, would encourage faster speeds in front of schools instead of speeds that might be more designed for 25 miles an hour in front of a school. So those are a couple examples. Thank you, thank you for uh, extrapolating a little bit on that. Um, so related to the, the, this being in the same agenda packet as okay. um, item 10.5 from earlier, um, that's where my mind went immediately that we're talking about utilizing standards to narrow narrow our roads it is that are different from the county's wider roads is is that what the intent of this uh, standard change is so you could you could use narrower lanes mm -hmm. that again are safer um, but it wouldn't necessarily mean that we would go and narrow our roadways that are currently out there that's not that's not the intent Okay. We're, when I were, when I mentioned Limonite, um, that is a new roadway, and so we we're looking at um, using a design speed to change the curvature of the roadway that would meet maybe a 45 mile an hour design speed as opposed to a 55 mile an hour design speed. Okay, uh, in that we have been utilizing the county standard. What is being asked, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is to not have a standard in the city then moving forward if we are to adopt um, alternative standards then we would have in essence a 
the possibility of having a, a meshing together of these different standards where we would keep the county standards where it is established and then um, have it narrow in other areas that it is not established yet? It, it well, m most of the cities already develop. So yeah. like roads like Limonite and Hamner and Archibald, um, those are pretty much in the, they're our heaviest used streets. So we would leave those the way they are, you know. So we're looking at um, areas where maybe it's the um, from new developments that are um, around schools or like, for instance, this, the, the Limonite Avenue uh, gap closure, um, allowing us to design that so that the curve is, is smaller to save us money. I mean, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. No, I, 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 I understand more than when we started, so I appreciate it. <laughs> so thank you. Hey, if, if I might, Mayor and, and Council Member Lorimore, um, I think what um, <clears throat> right now the city doesn't have design standards except for we still utilize the county standards. And so like our consultant said, well, I have to use the county standards for liability purposes because you don't have any standards. And and so the consultant said, we suggest, and this is what we see in a lot of other cities, is that the city engineer has design flexibility and uses their professional engineer's license to pick the appropriate standard for the appropriate street, where the county has a one-size-fits-all for all situations. And that's why we have some challenges in some streets and not in others, because they all look like Limite, except they, Limite, they just have three or four lanes or two lanes. Uh, um, and so uh, um, I, I think, you know, it, it also um, in the future could allow us uh, to not remove travel lanes uh, to accommodate certain things by having some design flexibility in the lane width uh, on, on certain streets, whereby uh, the county might say, well, our standard is 14 foot travel lanes, even though Caltrans has 12 foot standard on their freeways, the county has wider travel lane standards uh, in the county. And, and so why are we designing our roadways wider than what the state of California requires on the freeway? Um, and so um, one of the examples was when we were looking at Limonite, it was like we needed a 14 foot lane plus an 18 foot lane and so it was 30 feet of lane uh, um, across the bridge and they're like this is a lot of this is a great expense to the project and and we're a, a few million dollars short on that project so we're trying to get it. but it, the engineer said well we won't change that because uh, it would be our our professional engineer's license at, because you have a adopted county standard and you the city hasn't taken the next step to adopt their own standard. Um, and so this, these are just like, the county standard is a, uh, how do I say it? The county standard is a, 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 um, a creation of the California Highway Design Manual and the AASHTO Guidebook. All these manuals that he talked about are utilized and, and they have a lot more design flexibility where back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of engineers just said we don't want engineers thinking we just want them doing this <laughs> um, and, and it took a lot of the local control away from engineers uh, um, to do that and so that's where bill and the consultant were just saying we, we'd like to have a little bit more local control and more professional engineer flexibility to design our roadways and and then they just document the standard in which they used but it, it can flow from one one thing to another I, I appreciate that, it, but your, your comments, um, it clarifies, but it also um, raises an additional question, and this is for our city attorney. Um, the, the discussion that was there regarding um, liability that the, the design, the, they, they did, the engineers did not want to, they could not move in that direction because we hadn't adopted something other than what the county is. by changing our standards or adopting standards outside of what we have been utilizing on the natural because of um, 
what we are presented with from the county. If we do this in order to change the standard, are we covered from a liability perspective um, because we've adopted these new things? It, it, it doesn't. Are you tracking? I am. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. the liability question um, stems from a provision in state law that's referred to as the design immunity for public agencies, where if someone files a claim with the city, say they were in a vehicle accident or, or, or some other um, accident where they were injured or damaged in some way, and they file a claim with the city claiming that the design of the roadway, the intersection, whatever it may be, is dangerous, typically there's an immunity for that where the city can't be held liable. However, you have to show that the facility, the intersection, whatever it may be that's involved, was constructed according to an approved design that was either approved by this body or this body has delegated authority to a staff member, typically the city engineer, to design the, the facility. So what this resolution does is it um, provides the city engineer with that clear delegation of authority to approve the design of your public improvements which helps with your design immunity in the long run. Um, that's not the only way to achieve design immunity, however. So um, we can certainly have an adopted set of standards by this body that need to be followed by staff. That would also work. Or as projects come along, if you're putting your stamp of approval on the plans that are put in your packet, that, that also is a method of getting design immunity as well. So there's sort of multiple ways to achieve that end goal. Any other questions or comments? If no further questions or comments, then I would solicit a motion on this. So I move. Second. Mr. Donahue. Councilmember Yao? Yes. Councilmember Lorimore? No. Councilmember Tassari? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Plot? Yes. Mayor Rigby? Yes. Motion passes four to one. All right, moving on to item number 13, city manager report and city staff report. Good evening, mayor and council members. Uh, on November 6, economic development manager Kimberly Wright and council member Laura Moore attended the economic, uh, UCR economic forecast event. At the event, Eastville was named by a panelist as the world's number one location for OC Millennial tra to transplant. And, and that was an interesting uh, quote that one of the panelists said. On November 6, we celebrated the ribbon cutting for Bright Now Dental located at the station at Cantu and Hamner. Uh, the ribbon cutting ceremony for the Eastville STEM Academy took place on Eleanor Roosevelt High School on November 8th. The groundbreaking event for the Skyview Event Center in Harupa Valley was held on November 8th. On November 11th, our fourth annual Veterans Day ceremony took place at the American Heroes Park. The I-15 Limonite Avenue Interchange Project ribbon cutting ceremony will be taking place tomorrow, November 14th at 9 a.m. at the new park and ride just across the bridge in Harupa Valley. Also tomorrow, we'll be hosting uh, the California Traffic Control Devices Committee uh, which I serve on, uh, appointed by the, the director of Caltrans in Sacramento, uh, um, and it will be here in council chambers starting at 10 a.m. The Inland Empire Economic Partnership will hold their Turning Red Tape into Red Carpet Awards and Reception Dinner on November 14th at the Mission Inn Hotel and Spa. The Hamner Place Project is a finalist for an award for reuse and redevelopment, and I believe Mayor Pro Tem Plot and Community Development Director Gina Gibson Williams and Economic Development Manager uh, Kimberly Wright will be attending that, and I might uh, crash it uh, uh, later on. Um, I, I have a we have, we have two awards. Our city is getting multiple uh, potentially getting multiple awards in one night, and so I am going to I'm choosing to go to the PRS A Inland Empire 2019 Polaris award ceremony will be held on November 14th. The city of Eastville is a finalist for four award categories for our website design, brand guide, and for our economic development and recruitment videos. Um, and so 
uh, we're excited about that. And, and as a result of all those awards, we might also be in the running for agency or something like that of the year. So I, I, I'm not sure all the proper terminology, but we'll find out uh, to hopefully tomorrow night, and we'll bring home some we'll bring home some gold. Um, the city clerk's office will host another U.S. Passport Day at Eastville City Hall on Saturday, November 6th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. November 16th, I'm sorry, Saturday, November 16th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It was a sellout walkout crowd, uh, a walk-off crowd. Uh, Walk-ins are accepted and scheduled appointments are not needed. Uh, just form a line in the morning. Uh, passport Day is open to the public, and all passport applicants and their families are welcome to attend. For more, infor for more information, please contact our city clerk's office at 951-703-4420. And we'll even take your picture there and everything. So, um, And bring a checkbook to so write the check. Uh, um, so uh, the Winter Wonderland, as Santa said earlier, the tree lighting ceremony will take place on Saturday, December 7th at the Eastville Community Center. Uh, AAA, as you might have seen, just hung a banner across the way, has an opening soon. The banner is up and participants opening in the Eastville and, and anticipates opening in the Eastville Gateway in early December. So we're excited about that new uh, office building uh, in our retail space right next to Chipotle in Ulta. Um, Little Eastern Cafe located at the station is working on finishing touches and will announce their opening date uh, soon. Joining the merge with an expected fall 2020 opening is Dog Haas Beer Garden and Pure Bar Fitness Studio. So we have two new um, businesses coming to Eastvale in 2020. Uh, the Community Enhancement and Safety uh, Team performed a neighborhood sweep during the last week that included all residential properties north of Limonite, east of Scholar, and west of Hamner. Below are the stats showing the violations, a total of 99 cases 99 cases in that area were opened, and, and these are all uh, enforcement through education. These are all warnings for compliance. Uh, 57 uh, for trash cans in public view, four for abandoned inoperative vehicles, two for play equipment right in the right of way, usually basketball hoops in the street, uh, our future NBA, WNBA stars, eight for junk uh, garbage in public view, one for outdoor storage, seven for recreational vehicle parking, 21 for property maintenance, usually dead lawn or bare dirt landscaping in front or visible side yard. So um, we're getting out and doing some proactive education in our neighborhoods, and we're going to eventually sweep the entire city. So we're, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. And here's kind of a map that just shows all the cases that were opened in those two last sweeps. And so uh, a lot of good uh, proactive outreach to the community. Um, we are also looking, we have a, a a tentative use permit in for a marathon that is looking at, to be on April 25th, uh, or half marathon, I should say. Um, and we had the town hall meeting last night, which had a great turnout, and, and we learned that it will be the last town hall meeting. Uh, um, um, but um, it looks like the town hall and the neighborhood watch program are merging efforts, and so we're excited to see where that goes with uh, neighborhood watch 2.0 um, and. Amazon overtime is going to be starting very soon for the sheriff's department, and so anticipate uh, larger traffic on Cantu Galliano as their staffing goes up to nine or ten thousand employees um, and multiple shifts. Um, we also did a big Brian, if I can interrupt you on that, I'm sorry. For the Amazon increase in employment over the holidays, are they doing any offsite additional parking? I don't know what uh, th I don't know what their plans are. Okay, uh, I can look. Can, into can we that. look into that? Just yeah. because last year I know that they did an offsite parking that was closer to their facility rather than the one that we approved the bridge and they built the bridge and used that one. Yeah, uh, yeah, they they probably will be using the dirt right across the way from there. And what we did last year is we put up a fence, uh, mm -hmm. a construction fence, to encourage them to go down to the crosswalk and the bridge area. So perfect. Uh, um, Thank you. So, so we. When it first started last year, that we had some challenges with it, but we uh, encouraged them to do something a little bit better over there. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then, um, but that I don't know if they're doing that same approach this year. I need to look. In. We also did uh, the RSO did a great marijuana rental home bust um, or rental properties uh, bust, and they uh, it was on um, Hollow Weed. 
was the operation. Uh, it was on October 30th, I believe. Uh, um, and uh, they uh, did eight homes or something along those lines, and uh, they, they confiscated over 5,500 uh, um, plants and made nine arrests, uh, and those were felony arrests. Uh, um, and then uh, here this week, they, did, they had 160 deputies uh, in, in the region, and they did a sweep, a gang sweep, and they made 123 arrests. And so um, we, we really appreciate the proactive approach from RSO to check in on some uh, uh, challenging properties. And it was interesting, uh, you know, when people talk about marijuana grow houses, if you see something, if you smell something, if you see something different, if you see suspicious activity, please let the city know. You can let our community enhancement safety, or you can call the non-emergency line for RSO, uh, um, and they will go out and take a look at it. Um, they could often be stealing power um, and causing a fire hazard in your neighborhood. They could have illegal stuff that's going on in the property that could cause a, a fire. They could have false walls. Um, and um, and um, in another city, they even had a murder as a result of the grow house because that stuff is worth something. And so somebody else was trying to steal it and, and an altercation happened. Uh, um, and, and so we just have to recognize that some of that does cause cause uh, some dangerous issues so um, and I think that is the end of it we had a lot going on since the last council meeting. sorry about that Lee. no thank you thank you for the report we'll move on to item 14 City Council communication committee reports we'll start with League of California Cities oh, oh, we got one more thing I, I'm sorry Just kidding uh, uh, also during that time we had the Cosecha uh, San Diego uh, um, uh, event at, at and Chef Steve Brown came, a, a number of you participated, and a number from the community participated, as well as people from all over Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego County, and the city of Riverside. It was amazing uh, to see the participation from all over Southern California coming. Uh, it, it was um, grade A5, a Wagyu beef. This isn't the ground Wagyu beef that you get, at, at, or they sell sometimes at a, a, a someplace that labels it as Wagyu. This is the real stuff. Uh, um, and uh, he entertained people with his chef dining experience and uh, created some really interesting dishes, uh, nine dishes. So if you think about 40 people per, per night, four nights times nine dishes, that's a lot of dishes. But we transformed the citrus property into a, into a restaurant, uh, or he did, with his team. And there's uh, them preparing. And, and that guy right there in the bald head is, was his uh, sous chef. The guy has actually died three times. He's a 9-11 survivor. He's an uh, Iraqi veteran survivor, and, and some other incident happened. Uh, um, so he's a, a fallen hero amongst it. It was really neat to hear his story and, and how this is like his third or fourth profession that he's been in. He went from being a firefighter to a, a military to, to uh, now a chef, and it's, it, it was pretty amazing to hear his story. Um, but a lot of people had a great experience there, and we really transformed the property. Uh, um, and got to see a different experience for that property and um, tell the history of one of the oldest homes in our in our community. And um, I think people had a, a good uh, time, and we learned a lot as a city and a staff about what it takes to pull off a facilities event uh, um, and what it takes to have a facilities team um, because we all uh, wore different hats in that, that process, um, but it was a great learning opportunity for all. Thank you. Item number 14, starting with League of California Cities. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, League of California Cities, if it's not already on your calendar, put it there. We have our uh, League Division meeting. Uh, it's going to be taking place in Corona on Monday um, the 18th, so right around the corner. Get in your reservations if you already haven't done so. And um, it's going to be great. Uh, you will hear from me talking all about what the state league is doing and what the what has been accomplished um the next state board meeting will be taking place in the beginning of december so that concludes my report what time is that at again uh the time is it's in my calendar five um it says here five five o'clock no. city manager starts earlier <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. 
Skag. Yes. Skag. We got all kinds of fun stuff happening at Skag. Um, do you want to kick it off? I can give uh, our uh, committee, yeah. but uh, we voted to send the, um, the regional housing element out to the through the SoCal Connect. Uh, that's going to go out to the public, and there's going to be hearings on that, so everybody will get to see what the new housing elements are going to look like. Uh, in Riverside County, there's a, a hearing that's going to be on December 2nd at 2 p.m., and that's going to be at uh, Western Riverside Council of Government's Executive Committee meeting at uh, the County Administration Administrative Building. Uh, there's also going to be one that same day at 4.30 p.m. at Coachella Valley Association of Governments, and that's at their Executive uh, Committee meeting in Palm Desert, and on December 11th, at 9.30 a.m., RCTC meeting. Uh, they'll be doing a presentation there, and that's at the county administrative uh, building also in the boardroom. Excellent. Um, the, there were uh, a participant in two SCAG meetings since our last meeting. The first one was um, a conference call, actually, and it had to do with the General Assembly Host Committee. So uh, as... This, the position of second vice president comes with uh, all these other fund duties, so I, I get to do fundraising. Um, and so they were telling me about a ridiculous amount of money that I get to raise for that, so in, in my free time. Uh, so that, that's, that took place on um, October 5th. And on October 7th, the regional council had their meeting, and um, at this meeting there was the discussion about RENA methodology, regional housing needs assessment. Um, and so there, there, were, there was a proposal that was put forward by SCAG, and the numbers associated with that, uh, following that methodology, um, we had, in, for the city of Eastvale, a number of 2,397 units. Um, there was a substitute motion that was put forward, an alternative anyway, um, and that was put forward by Mayor Rusty Bailey out of the city of Riverside. And that took Eastvale's number to 2,913. Um, and I represent SCAG uh, for the cities of Eastvale and Harupa Valley, as well as Norco. Uh, two of the three cities, Eastvale and Norco, um, increased with the change in methodology. I did some quick spot checks. Everywhere else in the Inland Empire, with the exception of Eastvale and Norco, uh, went down considerably. Um, and the intent of Rusty Bailey's motion was to move to take local control out of the equation, of local input out of the equation, and also to move the RENA, the low, the, well, the RENA numbers more towards uh, the jobs, one, and transportation hubs. And so it heavily decreased places like, um, let me pull up my little picture here. That over in, uh, there was a decrease from in Desert Hot Springs, for instance. They had been allocated under SCAG at 84, 8,470, with the new allocation was 3,850. Hemet went from 12,640 down to 6,449. So the intent, I, I think, was good um, with, with this methodology that was put forward, but it absolutely uh, negatively impacts the city of Eastvale and Norco. Norco went from 42 to 417, so a tenfold increase. And so I argued against it, voted against it, um, citing that the intent was right, but the output, that there's something wrong with it. And um, so we do have an option to uh, appeal these numbers, and I hope that we do so. So any, any questions? I'm happy to answer. Yeah, thank you for that and for representing us. What do we have to do for that appeal? I'll get back to you on that. Okay. <laughs> but no, th th there is an appeal pro appeals process. 
Um, it wasn't ex articulated what that was, and um, I've been meaning to follow up. But okay. I, I believe we have time. Okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Ryan. Yes, sir. For uh, Councilman Lorimore. The, uh, when you say appeal, do you, is, are you talking about uh, the individual jurisdictions appealing or SCAG appealing? Oh, no. The, the, in, the individual jurisdictions can appeal the number assigned to them. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. W. Arcog. Um, at the last meeting, the big subject for that uh, meeting was the uh, increase in... Uh, fees for residential uh, single-family homes uh, which passed actually I voted against it but uh, <laughs> I was in the big-time minority on that one um, but anyway what it does is it increases the uh, cost of uh, fees on a residential dwelling from ninety four hundred dollars up to ninety eight hundred dollars so I mean it's not a huge increase but we don't need to keep stacking and stacking because they're going to come back next year and they're going to add some more. Um, the only good thing was that they didn't add anything to the uh, multi-retail and uh, service and industrial, so they left those the same. Thank you. Riverside Transit Agency. No updates for me. All right. And then Western Community Energy, we met today. Um, we have been going back and forth with the SCE on a launch date, and originally it was April, then it was moved to July, then it was moved to September, then it was moved to December, and then now they moved it back up to potentially April, and then now they said, yes, we're going to do it in April, we're going to start the, the, the implementation in April. So um, they're dividing it up, there's seven cities. Um, that are in the, the uh, in Western Community Energy, uh, but currently there's only six that are participating, so they're doing half of them in April, and half of them will be implemented in in May. So Eastville, Norco, and Rupa Valley will be done in May. So May 2020, we will um, have the, the switch to the Western Community Energy. I also attended, on behalf of WCE, I also attended a Cal CCA conference in Redondo Beach last week for a couple of days, and it was very comforting um, because when you spend a substantial amount of money in launching something new, you're always still somewhat skeptical on the true savings and how things are being done, um, and it was very comforting to attend that and for them to be presenting, you need to make sure you do this, you need to make sure you do that all these different things. And as I was going through the sessions, it was nice to be able to say, yep, we're doing that. We're doing that. We've done that. So it was very comforting to know that we're doing that. And we have a big buffer in, in all of our finances. So it's, it's looking really good. It, it was a lot uh, more comforting. One of the things that was shared, we had an elected luncheon um, one of the days that we were there. And there were a couple of assembly members that were there and spoke. And they said that CCAs, community choice aggregates are still a new topic for legislators. So they said it's important for us to be able to educate and share that with them. And they, they even went to the extent um, to say that it's not only with this, but it's with a lot of things. When you go talk with your legislators and you go bring up a bill and you say, you know, A, B, whatever, what's your, your take on this? Half the time, some of these legislators don't know what you're talking about because there's so many bills, there's so many things going on there. So they said, um, please make sure to take the time to help educate them as it will help them to make more uh, better informed decisions. So we briefly talked about that today and we're going to, uh, on WCE side, to educate on Cal CCA or on CCAs, we're going to set up times to meet with our, our local legislators to be able to ed help educate them on that. But it's looking good. Ultimately, look forward to April, May of 2020 for the launch of WCE. Northwest Mosquito and Vector Control District. Meetings next week. Riverside County Transportation Commission. Um, yeah, since, since our last meeting, I've attended two Riverside County Transportation Commission meetings. The first one was on um, October 28th, and it was the Rivers, Western Riverside County Programs. And um, 
a lot of so this is a subcommittee that uh, well cities in Western Riverside County uh, participate in and at that level um, up for discussion was uh, what was referred to as the back office programming and staffing associated with the tollings and um, it turns out I think it was a 10-year um, possibility of contracts uh, shorter but with the option to renew um, but that was done up front um, that was decided upon and then at that subcommittee level it has now filtered up to the meeting that we had this morning with the Riverside County Transportation Commission uh, Commission meeting and it turned into a very long meeting it started at 9 30 and sometimes these meetings go 30 minutes um, maybe an hour this one we were there for a full two hours and um, so that was passed um, the uh, 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 subcontractor was um, adopted and they're moving forward with that as the same one that was selected at the uh, Western Riverside County programs meeting um, up for discussion today though was the future allocation that as I think you know RCTC is looking to do another uh, in measure a ballot measure uh, for 2020 and moving forward in I believe November of next year and to ask for a continuation of the sales tax that's already in place and um, so what they're looking to do is how to allocate that there's a geographic allocation and then within that geographic area uh, so specifically I know that we fo I focused on Western Riverside County as being one of those geographic areas and then of that uh, requirement at least in the past the methodology for distribution of funds uh, or the current one I should say is to have 29 percent of 900 an estimated 925 million dollars collected over the life of measure a would go back to the local level so measure a dollars that we utilize to uh, for different projects like what was discussed earlier with the bike lanes resurface road resurfacing whatever it is designed to come back to the source the additional 71 percent is designed or allocated as of now towards regional projects um, like bigger facilities that would alleviate traffic at, at a larger level so interchanges etc and um, there has been discussion at a subcommittee level which I am not a part of um, and the recommendations or some of the discussion out of there is that that 29 percent be decreased and less money go back to the source and that money be pooled in order to take care of larger infrastructure regional plans uh, not not or regional facilities and um, part of that discussion also meant that cities would have to come together and argue for and plan together for these larger projects um, so I, I argued against this I, I recommended that we stay with the current formula uh, there, there were some people that were in favor of moving forward um, this is not a, a, a done deal by any means in fact the next um, RCTC meeting will be where we get into the weeds on this but I wanted to put on your radar that some of the discussions um, for this theoretical uh, new new measure a dollars that will maybe be passed in November of next year um, they're talking about how that money would be distributed and that it would change so those that part of what is our budget now of measure a dollars that we can count on might not be there in the future and so uh, I, I would also love to if I'm speaking I'm speaking for the city this is how I feel that I, I think it should come back to the source if the council feels otherwise please let me know <laughs> the important thing is to know who those people are on that subcommittee and what cities they represent so, so that that gets back to their constituents that they're trying to remove money from their their own local programs thank you thank you for that update 
uh, Western Riverside County Regional Conservation Agency. We had a uh, we we have a new executive director. He had just just retired. Um, the new executive director, I'm blanking out, and I couldn't find it on the website. He used to be um, a Riverside County supervisor. Clint, I think you have the answer. You're like nodding your head. <laughs> oh, you don't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can see him. He looks like Ron Loveridge, but he's not Ron Loveridge. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, I've been, I've been trying. I've been thinking about it for the past like ten minutes or so, and it's, it's not coming up. Um, but yes, we have a new executive director, interim executive director, and the species of the month. It's a Santa Ana River woolly star. I'll show it to you. It's this one. It's native um, to Santa Ana River, and you can only find it at Santa Ana River. It's um, you can't find a whole lot of them anymore because they own, they require floods to grow, like not only water but like flood, and we haven't been getting much rain or let alone floods. So um, it's definitely they're they're monitoring the species. Thank you, JCSD Parks Commission. I think we meet next week, so there'll be an update. But there is an update on JCSD's Parks Commission. They recently had a volunteer appreciation dinner where they recognized different organizations, different volunteers for their service to the community. And we have a very special volunteer uh, amongst us who was recognized as the ultimate volunteer of the year by JCSD, which was Councilmember Tassari. So. Great job. I sat, I was sitting next to him when they they announced it and they announced his name and he leaned over to me and he said, holy cow, I would have never expected this. But I, I was thinking about that and I told my wife after, I was like, that's what gets him that recognition is he does it because he doesn't expect it. So his service in the Qantas Club, his service to the city on the council, all the things that he does, he does because... He truly wants to help and he doesn't expect anything in return. So it was, um, it, it was perfect what he said that I didn't expect it. And yeah, obviously, because that's why you do it. So great job and thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Lomar, did you remember that? Congratulations. Name? And oh. yes, I do. Tom Mullen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, I'm sorry, Finance Committee. Yeah, we meet uh, next Tuesday, so come on out and be there. Great. Any other council communications or reports? I have just a couple of quick things. Um, thank you to our law enforcement for the, the uh, probation, parole, checks, marijuana grow houses that you've done. I do have a question about that um, with... The marijuana grow houses, we have seen, I think we've seen kind of just cycles that we've seen them um, a little bit more populated, not as much and kind of going right now, it seems that we seem to, to have a few. I don't know if there's something that we can do as a city to help with that, or if there's something that we can do to meet together and, and figure out if there's um, something that we need to do to help support in that, maybe if, if staff and um, law enforcement can meet regarding that and then come back to us if, if we need to do anything to change any of our ordinances or whatever, just to, to help assist law enforcement any way we can. So if we can do that. Um, the other comment that I had was regarding Mr. O'Connor's um, comment. Uh, I was going to bring it up regardless of what he said in his public comment, but he talked about having the Veterans Day event in a historical society kind of thing. Um, I know we've been talking about our city manager kind of brought up um, doing some sort of monument um, for not necessarily Veterans Day, but to appreciate um, our, our military and just to have some sort of monument or something. So I know we've we've talked about it a little bit, but I think with my with my colleagues um, consensus, maybe if we can start to get that talking into action and, and start to actually formulate something to. Um, to get some sort of monument or something something special in the city of Eastville. Um, you have uh, Councilmember Tassari and I went to uh, Norco's Veterans Day uh, event on Monday, and their facility there is amazing. 
um, that they have there at the George Ingalls uh, Arena area. And that was all donated. So that was all by donated funds. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing. If you haven't seen it, um, I recommend, strongly recommend you go take a look at it. But I don't know if there's something that we can do um, maybe in the near future to just start looking at something that we can do here in the city to um, do something similar. The last thing that I wanted to share is, is I was talking with Eddie Torres, representative of Assemblymember Cervantes' office, and I asked him um, if we could get a meeting with Assemblymember Cervantes just to kind of catch up and see how things are going. And he said, yeah, it'd probably have to be um, after the first of the year. And he said, because you're aware of her condition. And I was like, no, I'm not aware of her condition. Um, she's pregnant. And she's due any day, so we wish her the best, and we look forward to triplets also. So we look forward to uh, um, her return when she, after she's, she's done, so after she gives birth and, and enjoys that time. So, um, but we just wish her the best and congratulate her on, on that any day, I guess, that's supposed to be. So any other comments or questions? Councilmember Member Lomar. Um, I, I, I love your idea about moving forward with something that is distinctly East Vale, like Norco has with it. Um, if we are to do a flag, we need to make it just that much larger than Norco's, just because. Um, and But what, one of the things that going to different cities, one of the things that I've enjoyed uh, in the city of Riverside, they have that walk that um, in downtown and along the way there are different statues um, it could be a long-term thing and statues can be moved I, I really love your idea of um, emulating what Norco did and not having city dollars um, go into it having these things donated and um, if we are to do something like that maybe in the future at the Leal property we, we could start with um, doing a specific statue and making it so that it can be moved. Um, I'm on a kick right now on Audible. I'm listening to all the founding fathers. I don't know how that necessarily relates to the city of Eastvale, but, um, it, you know, Adam ha Rush. having that. I'm sorry? Oh, oh, yes, that's true. Actually, that's the craziest thing. You hear uh, Benjamin Rush's name all the time, Dr. Benjamin Rush, in these, because apparently he kept everybody's letter under the sun. So um, he's very much part of the historical record. And um, also, fast forwarding a little bit, I love Teddy Roosevelt, so if we could do a statue of him, that'd be awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. So hopefully we can, we can start working on something like that, some sort of a group or something, yeah. All right, if there is no further comments from the council, then we will go ahead and adjourn this meeting. This meeting, The next meeting of the Eastville City Council will be on December 11th at 6.30 p.m., and this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for being here tonight.